Ran out of a lot of... <clears throat> Hello, one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass. I'm going to start this again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello one and all and welcome to Behind the Glass. Welcome back to Behind the Glass. Now I'm going to start this the third time actually. <laughs> Three times a bit out of practice. Just a little bit. We can all fit. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hello one and all and welcome to Behind the Glass, the podcast which aims to take you behind the scenes of the automotive, social media and just, just automotive <laughs> worlds. Oh my God. Okay. Excuses need to be gotten right now. Um, for those of you watching the podcast for the first time on YouTube or listening to the, us on the for the first time, Oh my God, Tony. Oh dear. Can you take over? Sorry, this is Tony from Government. He's taking over now. <laughs> Sam's had a very bad time recently. He's not been very well, oh. so you'll have to excuse him. I really apologise for returning viewers and listeners or new viewers and listeners. Um, what I meant to say is my name is Sam. I'm your presenter from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. This is Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. And I am returning from uh, a bout of illness uh, which rendered me useless for about 10 days. And I, I'm not quite sure that I'm useful yet. <laughs> I was going to say, you're not, you're not quite no, ready, are you? I'm not quite ready. But this is the first time I've turned on a camera or done anything uh, sort of more than move from my bed to the kitchen and back again uh, for for over a week I'm on the road to recovery um, by the time you are watching or listening to this hopefully I will have returned to the main YouTube channel as well with an adventure down to Monaco with Paul Wallace you're going with Paul? yeah on Friday sorry mate what, have, yeah, I was yeah. going to say awkward awkward what anyway. car are you taking? 360 I hope <laughs> Really? Yeah, well, you know what, okay. Can I just pick up on this very briefly? Because I know you're just waiting to rip me apart on this car. <laughs> Obviously, the last time you saw me with it was a bad experience. You was laying underneath it. Yeah, the supercar driver's <laughs> secret me was definitely a challenging day. It was. Um, but realistically, all the issues with that car have been superficial except for the floor falling off. Is that what your girlfriend said? No! Was she, was she okay with it as well? <laughs> she wasn't. Sitting in a car park for three hours? <laughs> she was a bit pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the floor falling off was because screws were loose, which is very bizarre. There's a conspiracy theory going on that someone's been unscrewing my floor. But anyway, that was just a weird, freaky coincidence. Don't look at the camera like that, Tony. Um, all the other things have been superficial. And let's not forget, I drove that car to Italy and back at the end of last year, and it was faultless. It was faultless. So I'm not actually worried about the journey in any way. And oh, I don't know if I would have... Maybe I would... There's a few surprises to come in that trip. Do you know what as well? And I said this in a tweet as well. I am surprised how good that car's mm, been. In the I, grand scheme of things. Yeah, it could be worse. You, oh my God, it could be awful. But you, touch word, touch word. And also, this is going out on Sunday. I'm driving down on Friday. I might still be in the middle of France somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> Stuck. We have no idea. <laughs> and you could own a Merchant Argo. <laughs> oh, my God. Paul, this is a dream car. What a disaster. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm slowly getting myself back up to speed. Today mm -hmm. is Wednesday. Um, and as I say, it's my first day out of the house for over a week. Um, me and Tony have been catching up. Uh, but we want to discuss here on the podcast kind of what I've missed. Um, because we unfortunately did miss an episode, um, which I can only apologize about but as i say i didn't want to um infect tony or die by leaving my bed well, I, didn't, so. I didn't want to come to your bed either. yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you for clarifying you. that <laughs> so unfortunately the biggest thing i missed new york auto show which i'm gutted about because that was the trip that i was really looking forward to and i had to cancel because i had a very dramatic doctor who was like you must not fly and i was like what yeah, he's like you must not fly we are heavily advising you not to fly and i was like oh shut up could another doctor he's like you really should not fly I was like, oh damn it so it was very dramatic i had to cancel all my plans and cancel hotels and send doctors notes and but i missed it which was a shocker however a few cars were launched that i would have liked to have checked out so I now want your thoughts and opinions, Tony, master of the car world. Okay. So I was going to be going with Audi. They very kindly invited me and they revealed there the RS5 Sportback. Which now, will do well. Well, we literally talked about the RS5 Coupe in the previous episode we of did. Behind the Glass a couple of weeks ago now, but it was the last episode um, talking about it. Would it be a, a rival for my 718 Cayman? Um, and we both thought that we really liked the idea of the RS5 Coupe. So, come on, what, what are your thoughts on an RS5 Sportback? Two additional doors. <sighs> Good feedback. Okay, great. We're both on form today. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for tuning no. in, guys. <laughs> well, it certainly looked... Because the, the, the problem with the RS5 and the Sportback have always been the RS4. It's, there's always been that car's Very problem. Very good point. 
However, because it's now got two doors, it becomes a little bit more practical as just a, you know, as compared to the, the normal RS5. So then it's just whether you want an estate car or a sport bag. I think it looks much better than the estate RS4, that's for sure. But that is their problem. Yeah, it's it's a weird one because um, obviously Addy have slightly changed up how they're doing things over the last few years. And we've lost the RS4 saloon, which was a car I personally loved. From the previous model. So From the, the, yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day. Yeah. I mean, this was a couple of generations B7? ago now. Yeah. I'm not going to know the letter. Okay, fine. B7, I think. I, I trust you. Um, <laughs> They obviously used to do the A, the S4 and RS4 Cabriolet too, yep. when that was a model. Um, so we've lost that because it's not an RS5 cab, is there? Yeah. There's an RS5 cab. There. I'm sure there will be in the new okay. show. There was okay. in, the, in the V8. But either way, so we, we don't have... We've got the coupe. Arguably the RS4 is the Avant. But we've lost a saloon. And we haven't got a convertible at the moment. So I think the RS5... What did I call it? Suit Sportback. Sportback. <laughs> Which one is? Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Is the RS7 to the RS6? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it's supposed to be, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's the biggest problem with the RS7, the RS6. Exactly. So the RS5 Sportback is an RS4 saloon just with a slanty back. Yeah. I, I, I've i got a bit of a conspiracy theory, and it's oh, controversial. Oh, go, go well. in. We love controversy on this. I, I kind of think that Audi have ruined the RS badge a bit yes. by making too many what well, everything's got an, I mean, an RS, RS Q3 <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I mean, yeah there's too many right there's an RS S1 oh if there is I'm buying it uh, yeah 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 because but, it's not there yet but if no, it, no, no. I mean like but I agree there's too too many RS models every single line has an RS yeah, version yeah. and and therefore it's less special right exactly yeah and weirdly I, one of my best friends from school um, very Do you have fortunate. Any friends? No, but I claim he's my best okay, friend. Fine. <laughs> um, had an RS5, one of the first gens, and he sold it because he's like, I bought that car because it was kind of when RSs were still cool. Yeah. And now there's RS everything. It doesn't feel very special to me anymore. So, see ya. It's correct because they um, don't they don't protect it. Yeah. It's not protected within the budget within the brand. Sorry. Anyway, I do think the RS5 is still a cool looking car. And so as a sportback, I think it will be popular because I see more S5 sportbacks, I think, than I see S5s. Yeah. Uh, definitely in London. Um, so, so yeah, in intrigued to see that on the road. I still want to get behind the wheel of an RS5, whether that's a sportback or a coupe. I Are you not driven one yet? Never driven one. Oh, I thought you yeah, did. Yeah, no, 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 not driven one. Oh, so you've driven the RS4? Yes. Yeah, so similar. Similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, a coupe, not a so yeah. Avant. Oh, right. Um, should we move on? <laughs> This is going to be an awful podcast. What was the podcast we made, which is the worst podcast we ever recorded? This was really is the worst, well? worst <laughs> podcast. <laughs> this one is exclamation mark at the end. Um, so next car that was revealed that I want to discuss is the facelift for the AMG C63. Sensitive subject for Paul Wallace. Um, I, yeah, because he's I, got the last thing. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Sorry. Um, he, I know he's just done a video talking about it. I think the facelift looks really nice. Yeah. Really. I, we've talked about this again a couple of weeks ago. We're repeating ourselves slightly, but I love the Mercedes di design language at the moment. Everything that they're doing at the minute, it's like, it's like reversing the clock, which is what Audi were doing five years ago. Right. Audi could do nothing wrong five years ago. Mercedes are doing that now. Uh, There's yeah. nothing wrong. Everything looks great. Yeah, it's yeah. just the, the subtle changes. It looks more aggressive. looks more modern. I am still loving the new S63 and S65 coupes when they keep getting posted in places. Yeah. Oh, I love the idea of that. Are you still in love with the AMG GTR? Absolutely. Really? Yes. Two but weeks on, we haven't really spoken about it much, but you are still obsessing over them? I think my problem is as well is what else do I get? Like... I need to, we can say this now, we, we and you know about this, but the Ferrari will need to go soon. <gasps> but not, not because I don't want it anymore, because my favorite car is as simple as that. Done. It's just because it's got to a certain, I've had it nearly a year. Okay. Um, mileage is nearly 5,000 miles. I normally get to 5,000 miles and I sell them anyway. Okay. So I've done 4,000 miles in that car. For those that aren't aware, Ferraris are particularly sensitive to mileage. Correct. And especially the newer Ferraris. Yeah. So when it comes to resale, the lower the mileage, the better, which is obviously a horrible situation to be in as an owner. Exactly. But when you're buying a Ferrari, you do really stare at those mileage numbers and try and buy a car with the smallest possible. So it's just the way the world works. But, but would you say that applies to you and your cars in general anyway? 
five k is a kind of rough limit. If from I new, buy a new, yeah, I sort of get five, okay. under five k, and then I, it's a psychological thing. Sure, no, no, fair so enough. I okay, so the four eight getting dangerously close. Yeah, so I'm I am looking for something to replace it, something that I can use a bit more. Because obviously I've got the Purple Manti and the Juicy Free RS coming. Absolutely. Oh my God, I'm so excited for that. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little, a little moment there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, okay, so so it's actually a really exciting um, prospect, I think. Replacing the 488 Spider for you is going to be very difficult because you say you love it. It's my favorite um, car. It's your favorite car. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you've got two other fantastic cars. Quite similar in the sense that the GT3 RS and the Purple Manti are sort of track weapons. Um, like just different variants different variants yeah, you yeah. know different ways of going about it but they're still track focused quite hardcore quite bumpy quite stiff yeah um, and so do you so you're saying you want something a bit softer a bit more of a cruiser it's just so hard because there's not there's not there's not a lot I haven't had like we spoke off camera and the perfect everyday all round car to use put some miles on it is a 911 Turbo S mm. it's perfect yeah yeah I can see that I can understand why but What's the point of having a GT3 RS and a Turbo S? They are different cars, though. But you are right; it would be like home from home. Yeah, I don't it, think you would. I don't think either would feel special to you. Exactly. I think you would lose the, the 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 uniqueness of the RS more than the Turbo. Yeah. So, my I'm so with you on the AMG GTR, and we have talked about it on the podcast before. I love that car too. Me too. But. You, you would then have three track-focused cars. And I know the AMG GTR is still a GT car and still a big lunk. And I know Shmi talks a lot about the fact that he can do long distances in that car. But it, it is still track-focused. But it is a lot softer than the other two. It's a lot more of a u- usable car. Because it's a front-engine car, I think. I think so, yeah. I think that's got a huge part to do yeah. with it. Um, and I often say, whenever I get into front-engine GT cars, F-types or AMGs or whatever, I'm always like, oh, these are the best cars. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. they're so usable. Yeah. Um, but they're expensive and and would you not rather have a I don't know what that sub 200k it's difficult exactly like ridiculous thing to say isn't it difficult to spend no, sub 200k on a car it's, it's third world problems yeah first, 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 first world not third, not third. Not third. <laughs> definitely not third world problems <laughs> what should I spend 200,000 pounds on oh god what is it like to live in the third world um, so so you want a sort of a comfortable GT style car that you can do some decent miles on. It's not going to lose a ton of money. <gasps> I want some. I want something I can use a bit more. That's what I want. How much is the new Bentley Continental? Specs. They're like they'll they'll be like so, one eighty, one ninety, probably. However, they will tank. Really? Yeah. They'll, mm. they'll be. They'll make millions of. I've them. heard great things there. It's a wicked car. Oh. I know what it is. I got it. I got it. Go on. DB11. No, I don't fancy it. Why not? It's more class than the AMG. It's more of a cruiser, so it's not so track focused. You're going to be comfortable with start. It's it maybe doesn't. It lacks a slight sense of occasion. I think the DB11 or or a lust after factor. But it's a brilliant car. And if you're just looking for a brilliant car, that is one. But I I think. The DB11 is, I like something still a bit more sporty and mm. still, like, I think it's you too be soft. That comfortable. Yeah, it it's too soft. soft. Especially the V12 and, is very soft. Yeah. And the Bentley will be the same. It'll be all very lovely, but I'd still want something that's a bit sporty. Mm. I have very weird taste. F-Type in, SVR. Yeah, but again, oh. yeah, no, no, no oh. that's, that would be good. But what tank, as tank. we know, because we've been watching those values for a year now. <laughs> 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 oh poor F type SPR. As good as they are. I mean, as great as they are, they're perfect. now worth twelve pounds on yeah, auto trailers. Exactly, so. Which is odd. Okay, so yeah, well you've got a dilemma on your hands. Do you have a time scale in, in mind for this for you? No, so um the Ferrari goes when it goes. Okay. When when I sell it, I sell it. Sure. Um if something falls in my lap, I'll I'll buy it, but I'm not I'm not you're not des- hunting something you're not de- okay I'm not- so we've got time to discuss this yeah, don't buy anything yeah. secretly without telling me well I wouldn't I no. always <laughs> always ring or text you and go oh I've done it oh, what's going on you well, go what I, I know. what are you doing <laughs> um, AMG GTR I, I mean it's just so cool isn't it I just think like 
what else can I buy? Like, there's literally... I mean, there will be a ton of options. I haven't looked because I don't often look at cars mate, sub 200k. Mate, there's not. Honestly, no, really? there, there isn't a ton of cars. Right, this is going to be a separate episode. Episode coming soon, Finding Tony. Maybe we should do a main channel video on this. It's been a while since we've done a main channel video. Mate, I haven't been on your main channel this year. No, <laughs> you have. You've been a GT3. been binned off for, for behind the glass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, main channel video coming soon. Finding Tony a replacement for the 488. Um, let's move on. The car that... Now, there were lots of cars in the New York Auto Show, but these are the three that stood out to me. And the one that really burned itself into my retinas that were at this time very red and weeping and I was having a horrible time, but still burnt themselves in there. <laughs> F-Pace SVR. Oh, it's arrived! I it's saw- here! And I saw... You posting stuff. Of course. Of course. Jump straight absolutely. on it. Absolutely. Mate, they're not bad value for oh money. Oh my either. God. It's okay, so reasons why I love it. Begin. Jaguar. Love Jag. Been yeah, looking yeah. for an excuse to get back into that Jag brand yeah, yeah, somehow, yeah. like being an owner of a Jag again. Yeah. Been looking for that for freaking ever since I sold my F type. Uh, we know that the Ranger of SVR is a freaking awesome car. Yeah. I've spent a weekend with one. I love yeah. it. And it's essentially a baby version of that. Yep. Yeah. We, oh, well, I think the value for money is fantastic. Yep. 75 grand, well, just under, but who cares? 75 grand. Plus options, though. Plus options. But 75 grand list, when you think that the Range Rover Sport SVR is what? How much? 99 or 97. Yeah, new I one. mean, it's over 100 with options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think value for money is fantastic. I've been looking for an excuse to have an SUV for the last three years, haven't I? Yep. Absolutely. And it's a culmination of all of these things. Jag, SUV, power, throaty engine, V8, like, ah! But, but is it cheap? Well, so they haven't actually launched the configurator yet. That was the first thing I did was text everyone I know at Jag saying, where is the options list? When can I configure this car? Because... This is how I got bummed in the bum by <laughs> the Project 8. Because this is how he got ill. Yeah, this is how I got ill. <laughs> if I go onto that configurator, tick my various options, and the car comes out at £98,000, I will be a little furious. It's not unrealistic that it would. <laughs> 20 grand's worth of options is potential, but the standard F pace, it was very hard to add much value. They were pretty well kitted. If you bought the portfolio or whatever. The yeah, ES as long as you went, yeah. I mean, but you know, they were yeah, pretty, yeah. I mean, even the the first edition or the launch edition, what was it yeah, called? Yeah, the they first were, edition. That was like 58 grand or something, wasn't it? Yeah, but for a small engine one. But... Small engine, but all yeah, the yeah. kit is what I'm saying. So I, I, I'm hoping that because it's the SVR, they're going to include quite a lot of stand. Like you get the amazing seats for stand and stuff like that, that I don't have to tick many options. But, um... Yeah, I would I would happily consider that car. Where it would fit into my life, when it would fit into my life, and how, I don't actually know. Would it be a replacement for the Cayman? I guess, maybe. Like, the timing could could work out, but we know that there's a few other cars that are contending for that space, and I don't really know when I would look to get rid of the Cayman. I'm yeah. loving it still. I think I think if, if it specced its sub-85, I still think it's a little bit expensive because it competes with the GLC 63. GLC 63 and the McCann. McCann. Turbo. But the um, the Stelvio Quadrifoglio I drove was 70 grand. Plus options. Plus options. I'm going for list price on no, everything. Fine, 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 fine. 70 grand for Stelvio and the GLC and the McCann Turbo are like mid 60s. 65 and 69 or something Plus like options. That. Plus options again. Fine. I'm going, going list again. Fine. Just, to clarify, <laughs> to good. <laughs> oh, so it's the most expensive of those four and arguably doesn't have the same performance stats because it's 0 to 60 is over four seconds when I think the other three are all sub four seconds. Which is amazing for SUVs. Insane. Like, insane. But for me, you're paying a little bit for the Jag badge and, and, the, and the waft. And one of the V8. Yeah. Because so few people are making big angry V8s these days. Yeah. But the GLC would be a V8, mate. Will it? But it'll be a bi turbo piece of poo. This is a supercharged freaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, as I say, let's wait and see. I, I need to drive that car. Uh, I need to get up close to it. But I could see that in my future at some point. I, I love the idea of it. And he, he will be eternally happy. I, I think so. Yeah. Let's wait and see. Um, so yes, so lots of other cars were were revealed or, or, or talked about at the New York Auto Show, but those were the three that I wanted. Did you see? Did you pick up on any that you? No, wanted? no, okay, uh, no, I didn't really. Cool. Uh, 
<laughs> you were busy again. <laughs> <laughs> on a, to find my on new a car. road trip, yeah. <laughs> exactly, shopping for yourself. Um, so the other thing that we missed, uh, well, we didn't miss, but we didn't talk about on uh, Behind the Glass, April Fool's. April Fool's Day. Yeah. You know, I had a great plan. Go on. I was going to go up to Red Line and pretend to buy a car for just to piss yeah. you off. Because <laughs> I knew you'd be like, you backstabber. <laughs> but big That's funny, that, because yeah. I was going to do a podcast with Archie and TGE. <laughs> <laughs> Big respect to all those guys. Uh, RGTG Red Line, what do you do? Um, but yeah, we missed April Fools. And something which I love about the car world during April Fools' time is that all these manufacturers try and jump on the April Fools' jokes. Yeah. Did you pick up? Did you see any of the jokes? There was one that I saw, but I can't remember what it was. I'm there gonna was, bring up uh, a website now that um, that is listing. So I'm using Auto Express here. I've listed the Lewis the, Hamilton joke. Oh yes, Lewis Hamilton, which we should yeah, include yeah. in our F1 roundup at the end. But um, uh, you know, I just suddenly realised, literally saying that right now, we should announce what we're going to talk about at the beginning of the podcast. That'd be clever, wouldn't it? Yeah, but we got to let excuses, people know because you're ill. Well, yeah, I'm, you would normally. Yeah, there's actually normally you don't know, there's about three doctors underneath here. Well, actually, that's <laughs> a bit weird, isn't it? You know, they're all you don't female. know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I am dying. Um, okay, so let's let's go straight into it. Apart from Lewis Hamilton pretending to announce that, I think that's like the third year he's pretended that he's going racing in MotoGP. I'm sure he's done that before. Yeah. So that was a pretty poor April Fool's. But kicking things off, Aston Martin's Project Sparta. I hope no one fell for this. This was the announcement from Aston Martin that they were making a monster truck, um, which was going to be a new race program to alongside Aston's current F1 and FIA World Endurance Championship. It was going to have 1,100 horsepower, V12, and, uh, <laughs> and be part of the US-based Monster Jam series. I mean... Engineered alongside the new Aston Martin Varakai SUV. Is that a real thing? That can't be real, is it? Is there, is there an Aston Martin SUV coming? Probably. See, I know. They, I don't, make, I don't they know all make is, SUVs. I don't know if this is an April Fool's or not. <laughs> anyway, how? I mean, that would be quite cool yeah, if there was an Aston Martin cool, monster yeah. truck. It does look amazing in this thing. Um, I wonder if one of these manufacturers have actually done April Fool's before and thought, actually, we're going to make Actually, that's a good idea. This is a good, good really positive this results. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> It would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. If that monster truck comes out. Uh, this one I didn't see. Honda concept, concept CRV Roadster. Oh, so this is like in line with the Evoke Roadster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Honda has really gone to town for April Fool's Day, returning with an angle grinder and whipping the roof off its CRV mid-sized SUV. <laughs> Amazing. I would love that because I, I don't think anyone else is mad enough, apart from JLR, to create a convertible SUV like the Evoke. No, it's weird. It's isn't it? just weird, but weird. I see them. People buy them. Yeah, but not many, mate. They don't God. sell a lot. They don't sell a lot. I freaking hope not. <laughs> um, okay, this one you might have seen. McLaren's little video about attention to detail. Yeah. I didn't really get it. No, because I thought that's what they do every morning. Well, I assume, anyway. yeah. So, so for those of you who haven't seen it, it was like a video and a few posts mm. saying that they measure the water in the lake at MTC every day and yeah. they, measure the the, they measure the tiles to make sure they, they haven't up. shrunk and, like, you know, just kind of. Everything that we laugh and joke about McLaren, they were saying like, yeah, we, yeah, we actually do it. Yeah. But, but yeah, we all just thought that's what they did anyway. Yeah, like, yeah that's what. It <laughs> was like, oh, cool, cool guys. Like, yeah. Just a behind the scenes video. Um, but very amusingly, I'm not going to tell you which one he is. Um, the head of social media content and everything like that, and I think he's got a much more impressive title than that, uh, is in the video. Is he? Yeah. I can't stop laughing whenever I see the clip. But I'm not going to tell you who he is, but uh, it's quite funny. So they obviously just rounded up a whole lot of employees and said, come act. Um, so yeah, McLaren. McLaren had a tough time following up. Do you remember that eight before's last year? MSO Feather. No. Oh my god, I didn't see that. It's got to be here. They covered it. Yeah, they covered a 570s in feathers. I didn't see that. And then they launched it, saying it was an MSO option that you could spec for your car. It was so brilliant. It was all about aerodynamics and weight and blah blah blah. It was hilarious. So for them to come up with something as good as that was always going to be difficult. Um, we've got the MG ZS with alpaca power. MG announced a new alternative fuel. The firm claimed that a new partnership with the something something alpaca has resulted <laughs> in the development of a version of a compact SUV that runs on alpaca poo. <laughs> <laughs> Again, quite good because in these days we're all looking for alternative options to yeah, gasoline. Yeah. Um, and I would have been because I might. I would have Googled, Googled a pack of poo. What, <laughs> a pack of poo. What, what is this? Is this a new fuel? I know this is an embarrassing question to ask. Why can't engines run on just like 
any flammable liquid. Like, why can't we fill up a car with whiskey? Like, I know it would have to be developed. Do you, like, I don't know if you're looking at like I'm, I'm an idiot. No, no, no. But my question being, right, I'm sitting here and I'm, we've been talk, I've been talking to a lot of people this week about electric cars and all this stuff like that. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> What I'm saying is, why gasoline? Like a pack of poo. Like I kind of believed that for a second. <laughs> do you know? What, of course like, you did. Do you kind of know what I mean? Maybe that's a stupid question. It's to a ask, really but... stupid question. No, it's not. Like, why can't someone come up with an engine powered by water that's flammable? Anyway, I'm, I'm ill. Um, <laughs> Mate, they're full of alternative fuels already. What is it? Electric. No, they're trying to do hydrogen, but that hasn't caught on yet because it's. Hydrogen bomb. But, um, <laughs> but electric is not the right road. Right, like, electric is the temporary solution. Let's just, okay, sidestep. Because I, I said so basically, because I was, oh, I had nothing to do. I got cornered in the room with family and friends and going, oh, what do you think about the car world? Where's it going? So, so you've... I've had some practice. <laughs> <laughs> electric cars mm. is a short term solution to a long term issue. Because, do you think? Yes. Okay, because it is not a clean way to produce a vehicle no the fossil fuels and everything that needs to go into actually creating an electric car and electricity still creates the same issues we just avoid gasoline in some yeah, shape or form. Yeah. the infrastructure will never be like they can't put the infrastructure in place because no. here in the uk the national grid would not stand up to it's at six percent now we would never be able to do it never if everyone out there had to change to electric cars right away the grid would fail and we'd Correctly. all be screwed yeah um, so even if people slowly start moving across, there will still be queues and you know, you'll get to a service station and you'll have to wait four hours to charge up your car. Yeah. So I don't believe that that is the route. I think it's a bit like HD DVD and Blu-ray or back in your day, VHS and Betamax. Betamax. <laughs> Mate, I'm not that old. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, manufacturers are going with electric because the consumers like we're we're sort of happy with that theory electric cars well, make not. sense to us no but but we're not happy but we accept it yeah yeah and so they can invest in that technology if someone bought out a hydrogen car right now everyone would be like oh but nervous about that hydrogen car like, oh not sure how it works mm, where'd right. you buy hydrogen from yeah but if you bought an electric car you can see a tesla station you've got lots of other people who own electric cars yeah. so i think the manufacturers are going in that direction and i do think for the next 10 to 15 years all we'll hear is electric 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 but I can't believe that is the future. No. I think it's got to be cleverer. Run on air. Yeah, whatever. I mean, I'm, you know. Quite a lot of the cars I've got out there run on run air. Run on air. Because <laughs> you never, never fill them up. But anyway, so completely <laughs> weird sidestep there. Um, but, but just something I wanted to talk about. Anyway, moving on. Um, Seat Arona Copper Edition. Seat announced... The no, first car, Falls. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> the first car ever that truly does cost pence to run. The Seat Arona Copper Edition plays on the mooted withdrawal of copper coins from circulation in the UK <laughs> and features a coin slot alongside the gear lever where one and two beat coins can be inserted to power the car by means not fully explained in the short release. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, that well, would be good. It'd be fantastic. Pennies into make yeah. it go. Absolutely fantastic. Um, now, one that I really want to talk about, which actually was separate, which I noticed, um, which I thought was hilarious. Have you ever come across the website I Want to Be a? No, I haven't. Okay, so this is, you need to get on this. Really? Uh, as a person within the automotive sphere. It's essentially a go-to place for apprenticeships in the automotive industry. Easy. So you can go on there if you're looking to get an apprenticeship and kind of research all the opportunities that are out there. Um, you can find out how to apply. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, I don't really know how I want to get involved with the auto industry, but you can see, okay, I can be an um, apprentice at Rolls-Royce and learn how to sew, or I can be an apprentice at wherever, Ferrari or McLaren and learn how to bash things. I mean, I, I, don't, <laughs> don't, bash I, I don't know if I'm to become an apprentice, but honestly, the amount of questions we get asked both of us how do you get a job in the automotive industry so to the point many. where when i arrived you got a phone call from someone yeah, saying yeah. i want a job and you went well what do you do because well, i just want a job in the car industry yeah, yeah, yeah. so i want to be a.com i'll put the link below because i actually love the website but the april fours was quite lost which is why i wanted to bring this up go on um so they came up with <laughs> top 10 jobs for 16 year olds which sounds like quite a, like that would be relevant for what they did but let me just read out a couple of these um this is all tens. a joke right yes you'll soon realize the first, the number one job for 16 year olds, 
Parking sensor beeper. A company which manufactures parking sensors has several opportunities for 16-year-olds to join them at this exciting time in the company's expansion. The demand for beeps for parking sensors sensors is forecast to double in the next five years. Successful candidates should be able to maintain an average beep rate of 100 beeps per minute. Candidates who are able to demonstrate a genealogical connection to the roadrunner will be invited for an immediate interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got that. Um, this one was uh, oh, uh, Tow Bar Tickler. A tow bar recycling <laughs> firm has a vacancy for a 16 year old to tickle old tow bars which have started to droop and have lost their performance. Tow Bar Tickling requires a, a years of training to perfect, but this apprenticeship will provide daily opportunities to learn how to stimulate old tow bars and get their iron fillings flowing again. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, so, oh no, this was my favourite one. Post code pen- pedant. A company which develops car satellite navigation systems is searching for someone who has a pedantic and quite unnatural enthusiasm for and understanding of the UK postcode system. Requires inputting every single UK postcode into a car sat-nav system to check it actually exists. Oh my God, can you imagine actually doing (laughs) that? Oh my God, it's hilarious though. I mean, like some of these actually are half... Uh, you could believe that half of these were actual jobs but um, I'll put a link to that below because you've got to read all of the top 10 they are hilarious um, and it's an awesome website as well so I'm more than happy to so the to website's not just an April Fool's website no, 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 no that's, if proper, that's just an article a on the website but no it's a website. Yeah, proper website for, for apprenticeships graduate jobs all that kind of stuff so check out the website as well but, but that article can employers is, go there to, yeah. to search for candidates uh, I think at the minute it's candidate focused but you want to as a Employer. Uh, employer you want to be on there so that you can get candidates to apply yeah, yeah. so if you got if you had an apprenticeship scheme you'd want to get in touch with them I, yeah, yeah. I assume I mean I'm just looking at it from a consumer side I, I don't think there'll be many of them about if I'm honest because no. there's lots of government ones but yeah look apprenticeship I'm just on the I'm literally I mean I literally stumbled across this a couple of months ago and I'm looking now look Apprenticeship indexes. Anyway, I'll put the link below because it's easier. We're, we're going to stare on a laptop <laughs> screen. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so yes, those are the April Fool's jokes, which I think were all pretty good. Um, third and final topic for today, because we missed it with my time off. Formula One! We missed uh, analysing the Australian Grand Prix. Now, w- this podcast will have gone live just after the Bahrain Grand Prix. So in perfect timing, um, we're totally out of date. Um, but do, we predict the bar- do you want to predict the Bahrain? Yeah, Lewis Hamilton. And me. I think Lewis. Lewis Hamilton, unless there's a shocking... <laughs> now, okay. <laughs> to touch on the Australian Grand Prix. <laughs> um, usually I watch and consume all Formula One content live just because I just I need to witness it immediately. Um, even if I'm <laughs> out doing something, I'm on my phone just to get the results. However, for the first Grand Prix of the year, my sister asked if I would watch it with her because me and my sister, I moved out of that flat. So she's by herself now. So she said, well, let's you know watch the first Grand Prix. She together, likes Grand Prix as well? Yeah, yeah. We've grown up all loving Formula One. Um, but she's a lazy bum so she said I'll record it on Sky because she's got Sky I can't afford Sky she's got Sky and she'll come over and we'll have lunch and watch it in the afternoon and I was like oh this is this is not going to go well how am I going to be able to avoid my phone all day so that the results aren't ruined because I can't go on Twitter I can't go on Instagram I can't go on YouTube I can go anywhere I can look at the comments for my video and I couldn't look at WhatsApp anyway I wake up go pour myself a coffee open my phone and my phone opens WhatsApp because that was the last screen I had it on. Top message, Tony at Gravelwood. Oh. I don't even really look and it says, Yes, Vettel! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I literally was like, oh, Cheers, mate. Oh, cheers, <laughs> cheers. I was like, maybe he overtook Lewis into the first corner and then Lewis is going to take him back and then win the race, blah, blah, blah. The minute... I knew that pit stop channel. I was like, yeah, okay, fine. Vettel's done it. So <laughs> totally, ru- totally ruined the result. But you were ecstatic. Yeah, because like Vettel's the one I always want to win. He's yeah, a Ferrari. You're a, you're a, well, I'm a Ferrari fan, but I'm a Hamilton fan. Yeah. So, so I was really rooting for Hamilton. I did feel like he got robbed and it was a bit unlucky. And it was fundamentally a pretty boring race though. If that hadn't have happened, the whole virtual safety car and Sebastian Vettel thing... It would have been quite a boring race. Do we need to explain the virtual safety car? I can and the give reason it a go. They... I watched Nico Rosberg try to explain it, and I didn't think he did it very well. So I'm not convinced I'm going to be able to do it well, considering he's a Formula One world champion. <laughs> and I'm just a random pundit. But yes, uh, do you know? Do you understand why? Well, basically, you can go faster in the pits than what you can out on the track. That's why you overtook, right? Yeah. So, so the virtual safety car was brought in to. Uh, 
uh, neutralize the race across the entire track rather than a specific yellow flag yeah. sec sector to neutralize the race, slow everyone right down and allow the marshals to attend a scene of an accident. Uh, an actual safety car obviously bunches up the field and gives the marshals a gap in time when they yeah. know that they can walk on the track, the yeah, cars yeah. aren't going to be there. So virtual safety cars are sort of a, mi a mid level. So what happens is throughout the, the track, depending on which track they got, they've got various sectors. There can be as many as 12, 15 sectors on a track. It's not the three sectors that we see as, as viewers. Yeah. And they have to arrive at these sectors, the drivers, with a, within a time. So like an average speed camera. It's like an, exactly like an average speed camera. Now, if you go through an average speed camera zone and it says 50 miles an hour, you don't have to do 50. You could do 52 yeah. and then drop back down. Yeah. You could do 48 yeah. and climb back up. Yeah. But it's just about that average, Your average speed. speed. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was the virtual safety car came out. Sebastian Vettel had stayed out um, on a longer strategy than Hamilton and Raikkonen. And Ferrari did this on purpose, knowing that he would have that chance if a virtual safety car or an actual safety car came out. Yeah, yeah. So the minute it brilliant. came out, the, brilliant. Yeah. Now, the reason that it screwed up so badly for uh, Mercedes is their data didn't show them that Vettel was in their virtual safety car window. Because as you can imagine, all these Formula 1 teams have insane amounts of analytics going Computers on. Everywhere. Computers everywhere. Computers everywhere telling yeah, yeah. them, okay, this is what, if this happens, that will happen. Yeah, yeah. And for some reason, their computer system didn't account for the fact that Vettel could speed up in the pit lane, yeah. as you just said. Because... Yeah, yeah. As you enter the pit lane, you, there are t two things called safety car lines. There's one when you enter the pit lane and one when you exit. Correct. And for racing, that's where you can start overtaking or, or, or stop overtaking. So the minute Vettel crossed that safety car line into the pit lane, he's allowed to go any speed he's yeah. liked. And it was about, I think they said it was 400 and, or 450 meters, I think, that he got flat out. And yeah. the other end, it was even more. It was yeah, like yeah. 800 meters or something like that. Where Hamilton, because his team didn't come on the radio and go, you're going to be really tight with Vettel if there's a virtual safety car. You need to be right on that average speed limit. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you'd be at 50, dead yeah. the whole time. Yeah, Don't yeah, give yeah. him anything. Yeah, yeah. Hamilton was just barbling around going, I'm going to go 45 and I'll yeah, zoom yeah. up a bit. You know, like, and yeah, he yeah. was just kind of doing what was needed, but nothing more. Yeah. Vettel In sprinted to the pit stop, <laughs> quick pit stop, sprinted out. And Beaton came out by one and point one seconds yeah, yeah, yeah. ahead. So it was brilliant strategizing from Ferrari. Yeah, it was an error from Mercedes because they should have seen what was going on and got onto the radio to Hamilton and said Vettel's coming to the pit. Be on it. Yeah. Um, would he have still been able to get out in front? It would have been a lot. It closer would have though, still. Right? It would have been a lot closer. Really close. A lot closer. But I think it was depressing to see how little people were able to overtake in Australia. Um, that race often predicts quite crazy results, but not a lot of overtaking. Um, but it, it seemed really difficult. So let's see, Bahrain, uh, again, not a particularly exciting track. Um, so tough, but let's hope it's a bit more exciting but than But don't you Australia. think, like, Formula One is a lot more predictable than it was? Like, normally when you get in front, if you're in front, you win. You say this, though. Think about the Schumacher years. I was the biggest Schumacher fan in the world, but my... God, were those processional? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, he, him and Barrichello were just out there. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, just gone. And yeah, so, yeah. and we've all had, and the Vettel years. Yeah. You know, so, so there have always been eras of domination yeah. in the sport. And I think you don't have to go back too far. Um, arguably, towards the end of last year, there was a lot of good racing. Uh, 2012, I think, has been quite an iconic season. Yeah, I think last year of, was good. Last year was good. 20. 14 was it Vettel Alonso? when was uh, hold on 2013 2013 Vettel Alonso okay I'm pretty sure god this is bad ah, losing track speaking of Alonso yeah um, he's going to be quicker this year yeah he's, he's faster right P5 yeah 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 but I think I think he would have been lower down without the virtual safety car he did the same trick Vettel did oh did he yeah but I, I do think McLaren are going to be good I think towards the end of the year they'll be, they'll be pretty because strong because their chassis is very good right yeah the, well this is what I found hilarious is that for the last three years they've banged on saying Honda's been letting us down our chassis is the best in the field if we had a good engine yet with the same engine as Red Bull and Renault chasing them Alonso was holding up a Red Bull and a <laughs> so that was a bit like oh, you got the same engine now so where's that chassis you were talking about um, so I think they do still have some work to do but it was great to see them a little bit higher yeah, yeah, up yeah. and Alonso a bit more excited I, ho I hope that continues 
Um, I'm going to have to wrap things up. I mean, we, we reached our time limit, but I'm, I'm starting to, to fall off the cliff again. So we're, we're going we're gonna to call it the end of this podcast. I think we started off bad. We, we got to an okay level and we've descended to bad again. We, we peaked at about we 25 peaked, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we peaked two weeks ago. You know, last week's episode, the episode two weeks ago did really well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you didn't hear that, um, go back and check it out now. Um, if you are stumbling across Behind the Glass on YouTube for the first time, make sure you are subscribing. Uh, we try and put out a video every week unless I uh, die. Um, <laughs> if you are listening to us, you can follow us on soundcloud.com for slash seen through glass and iTunes podcasts. You can check out Tony on his various social media links. They're all below in the description. And we'll catch up with you very, very soon. Goodbye.